Today, I have the pleasure of hosting Mr. Nicholas Camby. He is, if I do say, the second coming of 105 Kilogram Strongman. Uh, it's not very often you get the opportunity to talk to somebody who's won America's Strongest Man, Worlds, and set the Axel overhead press record. And that was within, I think, like an eight month span. And uh, dare I say, he's just getting started. Uh, Nicholas, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, Alex. Thank you for bringing me on. Of course, sure. it was a pleasure. And, and we got the chance to compete against each other last year for the for the first time. So um, that was always fun. And of course, I was chasing your big press, your big presses. So that was always uh, a, a fun uh, goal to, to set. Flattery will get you everywhere. Um, for uh, for those who haven't been paying attention to uh, to the kind of middleweight ranks of strongman, um, I see my I know where I am on the total pole. I'm I'm kind of a gatekeeper. Like I'm in a pretty good national level guy, but I'm in no danger of setting records. Um, and my uh, my press has always been all right, but you came out and just set the bar. Um, I remember the first time I was like, holy shit! Um, I saw you consistently getting up into the the high threes. And then it was when you hit that 405 double and it was with a push press. And I was like, okay, this isn't just smoke and mirrors. It's not just this guy knows that, how to jerk. That was leading into clash of last year. Yes. Uh, the actual, yeah. And that was one of the most impressive things I saw. But then I saw the 450 jerk. I saw, uh, I saw how much it transferred over to the log, which is rare. You're always like, well, how good is it on other implements? And then everything else started to get really well-rounded. Um, really quick. Just, uh, just give everybody a brief intro. Just, um, Competitive history, kind of where the last few years led you uh, as far as your competitive career right now. And um, just a little bit, a uh, little bit of history about uh, how you started. Sure. And I always, I always tell uh, my friends, if I start to ramble, just get me back in line. <laughs> but um, so I've been competing for about 10 years now and became a pro in the pro in like the, the the traditional strongman corporation pro system back in 2015 so since then i've been competing at every big show and when we talk about kind of big show at least um american's strongest man um osg or giants live world strongest man 105 kilo so i've been doing that ever since 2016 um nowadays we have clash and there's of course some bigger um international contests but i've done every big show since um and for the while for a while when i first turned pro um, I really put in my work in, so I was really kind of like the low guy in the pro system. So I kind of worked myself up. I was consistently getting fifth at America's Strongest Man. I eventually started getting third. Um, and then I went six years without winning a contest until 2021, where I won three major contests. And in the same year, I decided I was, I said, just keep going on the momentum. And I set three world records in the overhead um, in the same year. So um, really just last year was my breakout year. Um, and then going forward, looking kind of continue that, but unfortunately kind of bang myself up, um, more recently, but, um, competing a hundred, 105 kilos for 10 years and looking to compete another 10 years. No, that's awesome. And then you, you, uh, you get some of the old guys that give us hope, right? You get the, I mean, anymore, there's a lot of guys that are forties, even in their fifties that are like, maybe we can milk this for a little bit longer. Um, I had, and I had paid attention to you for a long time. I got started in 06. So I've been at it just a little longer, but it took me a really long time to get good. And usually you don't see a lot of staying power in this sport. You see a lot of people that kind of have a meteoric rise or kind of fizzle out. So what I've been watching you since you got your pro card and keeping track of your progress kind of from a distance. And I have a lot of respect for you because you are one of the guys that like, it, it almost looked like stubbornness from afar. Like you grind it out every year and it was this very slow linear rise from afar. It looks like you did have this just quantum leap out of nowhere because you're so far ahead of everybody right now in just talent and ability. Do you feel like last year you really did have this big push into being that good? Or do you feel like it's just the steady accumulation of all those years and then you just hit that critical threshold? Mm. That's a good, that's a great question. Um, I think that the past years when everything kind of came, started clicking together. Um, and when you talk about what makes a champion or what makes the, um, a winner, I think there's probably like nine, nine or 10 different facets that you got to execute hundred percent on in order to be that. Um, and I always talk, when it was go to the point in terms of, um, I like to call it like my algorithm. Like if I have my certain inputs and outputs, or if I put my certain inputs into the algorithm, I know I'll get the outputs and, um, you can't figure out what works for you and what doesn't work for you unless you compete and grind. So 
Um, I learned a lot of those stages. Um, at times I was progressively getting better, um, but then the events would change. And then I'm like, I would be really strong in these certain events, but then there's a whole new slew of events I had to get good at. So I could be better year over year, but, but sometimes that doesn't reflect in the pl- actual placement um, of the contest just because one year I had a press that was really advantageous to me. The next year um, it was like a medley or something that I don't win as many points on. So, um, but over time, when you keep, keep competing against the best, you start kind of mimicking the best. So I learned different tricks of the trade. I knew even I had like the big split jerk, but I didn't, wasn't really a great strict presser or push presser. So that was something that I adopted, but also, um, and again, we talk about having the big year in 2021 another big facet that came into my life and that really worked on was my deadlift that was also a big um big puzzle piece that was missing and um for your listeners if you want to win any good strongman contest if you're a very great presser and great deadlifter you're gonna go pretty far that's generally 40 percent of most strongman competition shows yeah that's that's absolutely true and um and the overhead press one is is kind of weird because you get a lot of people that I mean, there's a good amount of, I would say, 400 pound pressers if you go out and find them, but there aren't hardly any who are also good deadlifters and can run through all the events. And like you said, all those nine or 10 different facets, like that's one of them. You can't be the guy that can move and pull a lot, but it's like, shit, I zeroed the deadlift and and that's it. Um, So it is cool to see how kind of well-rounded you've gotten. And the other thing too is for as open-ended as strongman is, when you're the guy that's competing in the big contests every year, like you really do see that if you do three or four years of, let's say nationals, you really do see it's kind of a lot of the same stuff year in, year out until it goes through some like phase. Like I remember there was two or three years of stone of steel and that was like every event. And then there were like two or three years, like right now we're in a bag toss phase, which I know you love. There's just bag tosses at every single show that you do. And it usually wasn't like that. So it is hard to adapt. But speaking of nationals, early on, I always thought that I had to get out of the national system, just like qualifying, get into that just because it was a lot of the same events. It wasn't similar to the pro systems. Pro systems had a lot more maxes, had a lot more heavier weights. And then nationals were always very fast. Of course, yes, all these different split times because sometimes you have up to 70 competitors in a weight class. So I thought the faster I got out of that national system and won a pro card, the better I could progress because now I'm actually trying different events, doing truck pulls and and conan wheels, which generally don't see in a national because when you have all those competitions, all those uh, competitors and all the equipment you choose, you generally want to tend to things to have, have their, the easiest setup. So what doesn't necessarily mean items that you'll train for that will progress you faster. That's true. That's very true. I've always seen this kind of chasm between what happens on the way up through strongman corp to get that pro card, because they're one federation out of, well, two big ones, but then there's also like other events you can do if you go overseas, there's non-sanctioned events. There's a lot of opportunities to go to really, really high level shows, especially now with Worlds, now with Clash. Um, So it's it's breaking out. But if you're just in that strongman court bubble, it is, it's like, it's a lot of foot races. It's a lot of like, well, I hope I don't trip because I'm going to drop 20 places, you know? And it's like that, it's not just enough to be good. You got to have a really good show uh, in, in order to place. And It really is kind of, I don't want to say it does a disservice because it selects for strong athletic people, which I guess is good, but it really, it really is different from a lot of the heavier shows. And you see, you see quite a flip. I, in my opinion, I've seen a lot of guys that killed nationals that would go to like OSG and maybe not do as good as they thought they might. Um, But again, that's, go ahead. I was going to say the one stat I've been saying, of course, I, um, when I talk to Dan and Justin, if I'm trying to give them a hard time is that. Um, national winners doesn't necessarily equate to being a world strongest or America's strongest in the past um, X amount of years. The only one that has those one nationals and one ASM is James Deffenbog. Um, and then maybe Zach McCarley, uh, even back in like 2011 to 2012. So it's a very small kind of population of um, na- of national winners that go on to be that top level pro. So generally, like for instance, like Anthony or myself, um, either, even like Terry, um, Rady, they all won through either the Arnold or like a Platinum Plus yeah. um, the card, the card. So generally, so sometimes is a so maybe you could say it's a weak correlation between national winners and, uh, of course, the pro show winners. I would be inclined to agree with that. Now, I have a love hate relationship with nationals because my time spent shitting the bed there forced me to get my little legs to move faster. 
and I don't think I would have a, a motor if I wasn't forced to do that. But uh, that was just a, a constant yearly frustration was, was holy crap, like I did really well in the overhead, I got my deadlift good, but I'm five seconds slow in this medley against, Jesus, 70, like you said, 60, 70 people. Um, but that, that, was a, that was a hurdle to overcome. And it, it's, it's a very, God, it's a love-hate relationship with the sport. Because I can't think of, a, of an event that I like. It's like I hate all the events, but I love them, you know? I don't know if that makes sense. You're, you've gotten so, uh, so steady and even, but it's like, God, it's always like that one little thing that, that I trip up on. Um, but that's what makes the sport so good. It's what makes it interesting. You got to stay on your toes. I wanted to get to, uh, to Clash. Uh, that just went on this weekend. For those of you that don't know, Clash on the Coast started last year. Huge middleweight show, a lot of talent. Uh, um, really working to rival um, some of the heavyweight shows that people are very familiar with. And um, you and I both competed last year. You won, uh, ran away with it, if I do say. And uh, this year, you unfortunately had to pull out from injury. Were you there? Were you still there this year? Did you still make the trip out? Yeah, I, I, I made the trip. I was there. I got there I pretty much didn't change my flight. So I got in there like I was same day that people would be cutting weight. Um, so we got in there at noon so we can spend out some time um, get, getting out in the sun and, of course, catching up with everybody. So, yeah, I spent the whole time. Um, I had my training partner, Mike O'Connor, in the contest. So I want to make sure I'd be there for Mike, whatever he needed. And then um, especially in game times, so it was just so hot. Um, there was just some added pieces in terms of like cooling off the athletes after. So I wanted to, and also it was giving me a good um Good, a good experience in terms of like in the, in the future, probably when I'm done competing. So maybe when I'm in my 40s, I want to be that kind of um, all around coach, not only doing like programming and dieting, but also in your corner when you're competing, similar to what I was doing prior was like in wrestling. You always had a coach in your corner. So like that's kind of how I see it going forward. So, so like I have a handler per se. Um, so that was so I want to make sure that Mike and I also was helping out uh, Jeff Lee too, um, make sure they got to that they or they had the best contest that they could they could do. No, that's cool. That's a noble because that's in. I mean, that's real coaching, you know, and that's the thing that's kind of frustrating when you're just doing remote stuff. It's like a lot of the magic happens in in person. Uh, I didn't know you were a wrestler. And that's funny because you mentioned Zach McCarley and I believe he was a wrestler. Um, yes, but yeah, so he, he I think he did his wrestling after his strongman career. But I think, oh, he, did, he, did. I think he, did, I think he did like high school, did his strongman career, then did. Um, I remember he was, it was like club wrestling because like the NWCA because I was following it for a little bit, but. Yeah, Zach has, yeah, he is, he's stocky. He, he has that wrestler build. He's built like a thumb, as they say. Um, <laughs> and uh, Hobbit jokes abounded um, because um, I was from California. I'm in Texas now, but I trained, uh, I started at East West with Scott Brengel. I was there with him and Sean DeMarinas for a couple of years. And we would always go up to like Fresno for like California Strongest Man. And McCarley would regularly come down and, and train. And I want to say he was like the first really dominant middleweight like there were a lot of good guys, a lot of freaks, but he was, I think, the first guy that was like consistently like winning multiple um, shows, and and I think he won a handful of really big titles, and it was crazy to watch because the guy is like five seven, maybe. Um, he, is, he is a little shorter. He's on the he, short side. He, he makes he makes Sean DeMarinis look like a giant. <laughs> That's saying something. Again, Sean's another one, right? Really dominant one hundred and five, and he's like does not have the height advantage. So I guess the height argument goes out the window. Um, and uh, you're, you're getting Tyler Young hope right now. Uh, uh, Tyler, I'm rooting for him, man. Because if Tyler Young can do it, you know, I feel like, well, actually, I'm losing all of my excuses because I trained with Andrew Mock for a while, and he's six three, and I'm like, you know, it's, it's cheating. Like, you have, I need a different division. You have those long legs, but um, no, those guys show like how you can really do something good. But I think of what goes into making a great strongman and the athletic quality. And that's what I see in wrestling, just a very good, well-rounded, like you have to be explosive and very coordinated and kinesthetic, but you also have to have this motor and usually you don't find those things together. But it's just, it's interesting that, uh, you know, you have two, two people with their foot in that well that um, became so good at uh, the middleweights, especially where, you know, middleweights, I think more so than the heavies, really have to be able to go and move. Um, so and, you know it's funny. I, Kevin, Kevin, I listened to Kevin Ferris podcast with Brian Shaw, his first one ever. He uh, he was also a wrestler. No um, shit. In high school, yeah. I was at the show. I think at California Strongest Man. I remember he won, and he was a guy that kind of came out of nowhere because he wasn't local. And people were like, who the hell is that guy? And then next thing, and I believe that's where he got his pro card. I could be mistaken. I think that year was a platinum plus. But um, I remember I'm like, who's that guy? And then all of a sudden, it was like 
leapfrogged the 105s, went to Worlds, and is like, you know, a stud. So he, he, he's, he started in 2015. He had his like big year in 2016, and then 2017 he won his OSG qualifier. Uh, 2018 he won the he got second or third at the giant slide so he just went up very fast that is a meteoric rise man and it's nice to have your best competitive careers before they're sorry your best competitive years uh before you've had a decade to wear you down into nothing <laughs> it's like in the event that i ever win any major show it'll be like oh okay it's time to hang it up the knees are starting to catch up with me uh give me um some of your highlights from i watched the uh um YouTube cut of Clash that uh, Lawrence Chalet posted, uh, just kind of an abbreviation of the performances. Um, from as somebody who was there, like, what were some of the standouts? Like, br- break down the contest for everybody. It, it was yeah, it was a great contest. I thought the first event, a lot of the guys were a little nervous, but eventually they came into their own um, and started having fun. And especially um, when they got that first event out of the way. Um, so I was very proud of uh, Bob Schwantz uh, to, when he got into the finals. Bob has been there battling in the trenches for years. I remember he got he took second to like Furman like 2017 to get his pro card. So he's been always been fighting. He's always been like second or third. He took a second place at Waco to get to the clash. But and then last year in his heat, I think he took la- he was he took last. I think so. he took second to last overall when they combined all the points. He had a rough show, and I remember being very surprised by that because he did have such a good track record. <clears throat> So yeah, so I was super super proud of Bob, and of course he did it in front of all the ki- all his kids, his wife. So they're, he's a very proud daddy right now. That's or, fantastic. Or, or yeah. Proud of his daddy. Uh, so Isaac, the, um, watching him in his training, I knew he was gonna look look pretty solid. He had a good dumbbell, good squat, deadlift. I uh, didn't see too much of movement events, but just his static stuff looked really well. So he won his first four events, and then kind of just did uh, just the same thing I did on the odd object, just picked up the block and and call it a day. Um, so he won his four, four wins. So I wasn't really surprised. I knew it was like from that prelim performance that he was probably going to be a podium favorite. Uh, McKeegan getting second was also uh, pretty awesome. So McKeegan, his third time in seven months, he's come to the U S from Ireland. So he keeps fighting those, uh, that time difference. Um, but I think he really kind of perfect his peak from traveling from Ireland to the U S. Um, so he barely, he barely got in cause he got third in his heat. And what they did was he took, the last, they took the five um, third place, and they all competed in the top two uh, third places, moved on. Uh, so McKeegan and Hine both did it, but he won the little playoff to do it and then went on to take second. Oh, wow. So he, he was so he was very close from even not making the finals. Um, so just seeing that, like the fact that he got the chance to make the finals and then he made his run uh, was great to see. Um, my boy, Mike the Slice Cogden. Um, you, you know, lot, Cogden last year kind of got um, – not Rob, but any any other group, he would have made the finals, but he just had a really tough group with Richie and Tommy. He was in a um, rough group, yeah. And then even in his training, it looked like he was hurt, he's, he was hurt a lot of times, only training like twice a week, but he wanted it so bad, and he went out there and got it, and then also did an awesome job on the stones. Um, and then um, our boy, Tyler Young, um, it's interesting. Um, he proved me wrong. So I had um, another podcast of mine, or um, on my podcast, I talked about like my predictions for the year. I had Tyler as in terms of like my honorable mention in terms of having a great year. Um, but for Clash particularly, um, I just didn't think he was going to do as well just because his training is always pretty, it's pretty hot. It's like always like 90% or more. He's maxing out a lot. He's doing a random uh, 400 pound log and in, in, not in training, but he did like a small competition. So I thought yeah. like those actions might cost him but he actually he made it to the actual contest and like i did and so i'm like tyler your prep was better than mine but he was the biggest surprise and he beat he ended up beating justin not only in the um in the qualifying groups of the prelims but also in the finals so he was he and he and he beat the group that also like mckeegan was in there so he didn't so he had a really um he had a really great um contest so super proud of tyler um and then um my one, uh, the one stat uh, that I pulled out that I think is pretty cool, and, and for any of your listeners, a lot of times it takes so like in terms of those big titles, sometimes you have to go to those big shows. So like for instance, I didn't win America's Strongest Man until my sixth trip to America's Jeez. Strongest Man. So sometimes it take you got to be there to really, um, to really get the feeling and to really um, do better the next time around. But ten of the twelve finalists um, this at this show were there last year. 
So they're the so they actually compete. They don't necessarily make the finals, but they actually they competed. So they got a taste for it. They got a sense of like the conditions because it is very hot and things always kind of change um, last moment. So um, they're able to kind of adjust with the with the punches and able to kind of execute. Um, but the two the two that didn't uh, that weren't there were Hine and McKeegan, and th- and they were battling out for the third play, play playoff. So the so the ten that were here last year are the ones that came in first and second in the groups. So I think that was a pretty interesting stat. That is interesting, yeah. Um, for Tyler, uh, I I agree with your assessment of his training, um, and I think it comes with, and I think I'd asked you about this bef- uh, before. When you get into that point where you're hot and you're ready, like it's like now I'm ready to do something memorable. It's like hard to pace yourself. I think Tyler got to a point where he was really starting to get really good and no, uh, uh, get noticed. And he went on like a tear. Like I thought he was crazy as hell when he wrapped up ASM and then went to nationals like two weeks later. I was, I expected, and I was, I was impressed because that's a similar scenario. I did not think he would do well. I'm like, you're two weeks out from ASM. You might think you're good, but you're going to try to cram all this work into a small area. Uh, it's it. A lot of those events are fast. They require a peak and on and on. And he went and he killed it. He got his pro card. Uh, it, it, him and Frank, man, him and Frank left me in the dust. I'm like, we were on a group chat of like the semi pros and they both left cause they got their pro card. I'm like, I'm just here holding the bag. Um, but, uh, no, it is good to see. I, I'm happy he's staying in one piece and I hope he does, but that is a hard thing to try to balance the eagerness with the, uh, with the, the need to stay in one piece, the need to pace yourself out. Um, Congdon, Sorry, go ahead. Say, really quick, I think the only reason I don't do some of the glory lifts is because I was I was actually kind of a little bit of the glory lifters like 2014, 2015, and I realized after the after doing the big lifts and being tired in my competition, like oh this kind of makes sense. So I kind of made that mistake. So I think he's coming he's coming to an understanding that going forward, if he really wants to p- put a great run, he needs to put on a good peak too. But uh, you were saying about the Mike the slice. Yeah, yeah, and and if Tyler does that, I honestly think he can ratchet his performance up. Like, I think he has a little bit, he's leaving on the table. You know what I mean? Like, I think he can, he can bump up to another point where he's one of the guys. So given his Hobbit status, it's already impressive. Um, uh, for Mike, uh, I competed against Mike a couple of times in California. Um, my, Mike is an amazing athlete, man. Like, and I was, I was happy to see him come out and compete last year. And I thought he was a, a guy a lot of people were going to sleep on. But he's another guy. And... Does he have a wrestling background? Jesus. I'm going to start recommending cross training. Mike is a nasty athlete. He's unassuming. He doesn't look that strong. And he's not really that big. But that guy can move. He's well-rounded. And the heat he was in last year was nasty. I remember watching that heat and thinking, like, this is like when you put, you know, uh, Zadrunas and Shaw and, like, uh, you know, another third like terry holland's in a group and you're like okay well you have the podium right there and somebody's gonna get knocked out that was a rough group so that's awesome mike, mike ended up making the finals doing well this year um so he took six um six. he's right behind Hine, which is funny because Hine also so cogden took fifth one year at osg uh Hine took six uh, fifth at osg so i was saying that like Hine it was like a kind of like a new version of cogden but Hine's <laughs> a little more static okay Cogden's a little more moving okay but they're both kind of like actually I was gonna say I thought Hein was shorter, but I realized I think he's an inch taller than me. <laughs> That's right. You're you're what? You're six six one. So uh, five eleven and three quarters. I'm telling you, there has to be height caps in the sport. The weight classes aren't enough. Um, the squatting event, uh, I caught that because I remember how much trouble that gave everybody last year. I don't know about you, but I gravely overestimated uh, my ability in the squat. The long bar, the the propensity for hitting uneven at the bottom, and how devastating that is when you get thrown off to the side. Was the weight the uh, similar this year as it was last year? Do you know if they changed it? I think some some of the competitors thought it might have been a few more pounds. Uh, But I think what gave was tough for some of the competitors was just just a little bit. Last moment, they went from the – they had to go into the parking lot, and it was a little bit of a slant. Um, But in the end, I think the best squatter still won the the group. Uh, So, like, it wasn't a problem for Jesse, even if it was flat or not, or even if it was – before and after event, I think that would have been fine. But in the end, generally the, the, the best squatters were able to squeeze out a rep. And I agree with that as a rule. I think, uh, and that's the sport, right? You're always going to be pressing in gravel or 
doing something in a drainage ditch. It's like the best guys usually can fly through it. Um, I was surprised because I saw I saw a lot of guys zero that I think got reps last year, um, but it looked like just a slaughter. And there's a, I don't know I don't know how you feel about this. There's like kind of a school of thought that says you don't really need to squat to be good at strongman. Uh, how do you feel that? How do you feel about that? Is kind of a an approach to training for strongman. Hmm. Well, I think before I even last year, before we even did the squat, my best squat, it was like 600. We had, six, of course, 600 for reps. It wasn't again this year. I think my best squat was like a 535, uh, uh, 535 squat. And I think that was from a Zerkshire. So oh, wow. it was, so I hadn't really like pushed it. Um, but I think you do have to have a good amount of quad strength. So I always try to focus on like volume squats and then a heavy leg press because I like the heavy leg press that translates to deadlifts, translates to like pressing. Um, but it is squatting for for uh, hypertrophy or for strength building compared to competition is much different. Um, I think the one thing that I was focused on last year was having a really strong core even this year having a really strong core and kind of bulletproof in the squat position rather than focusing on hitting certain certain weights in training i think that's a really smart approach that core strength came in immensely with that long bar i mean i never would have thought that those those little inches of difference on on hitting the rails could make so much of a difference but you just saw people get stapled left and right and it was um fixed as well so it's so it's welded onto the actual weight so it the, it, it kind of moves on rather than the plates might give it a little adjustment so even when you you hit it might move on you and especially in your wrist and position so some some guys were not into it but some guys were going too slow and then they get no pop at the bottom and then some guys if they go too fast they will lose, lose the position so it is it is a little bit of a trick it, it definitely is um surprisingly different from just setting up the box on like your regulation sized axle and training, you know what I mean? There's so much more control, you get comfortable in your own environment, um, but it just goes to show how uh, diverse and ready you have to be. Out of all of the middleweights that you see that showed up to clash, and let's even say the ones that didn't, maybe there's some guys who really should have been represented there that um, whether it's travel restrictions or I don't know, uh, it's just difficulty getting around. Uh, is there anybody over the next couple of years of uh, competing that you kind of have your eye on that you think might be a threat might might kind of uh challenge your your throne sure, sure um i would i would even say that even to say my original group i had ryan saxon in it and i thought ryan saxon was gonna be a tough one to beat in my in my heat unfortunately he ended up getting of course i got hurt he ended up getting some kidney stones right before the contest so he had to pull out but he was t we were talking later about his kind of training numbers and he was sending in some big numbers on the squat He's been, his strict press has been going. So he's only 26 years old. So in three or four years, I think, and he's like an inch taller, I think, as well. So if he can stay moving, he can lean out. He has a great coach in Hannah Lindsay. I think he can be um, kind of the next someone to really watch, somebody that can challenge. Um, Isaac, you know, I've always thought Isaac was re was really good. Um, I wasn't surprised when he put a good training, uh, a training program together and then ended up winning. Last year, I thought that Isaac was going to be one of the guys that was going to push me. Um, but I, 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 refer, I told him at the contest uh, last year, I kind of referred to him as good time Isaac because he's always going like hunting and fishing and going to places. He wasn't necessarily focusing on clash. Uh -huh. And then he and then he ended up taking like mid pack last year and then realized that he had a kind of he could really put it together. So he ended up hiring um, Terry Rady again. And then they put on a great program. He's and he probably was probably looked best in training. And then you saw the result. He, and of course, he ended up winning the show. So, um, so I think. And he's only ooh, 28 years old, so oh, wow. I think so. He's in a couple of years. He could be really, he could be really good. I think he, if he really kind of, he's a. I think he's still a little raw. He really relies on some of that raw strength, but if he cleans up a lot of that technique, especially on like deadlifting and pressing, he's good. And that's where he, he lost some points, um, even in the finals. He's going to be really good. Um, and then, um, you know, it, it would be. I always say it. Um, if Clayton decides to come back, he he's always good That's for uh, Clayton. Always kind of, I think, kind of always puts himself not out there, but he always on the stories. If you, I don't know if you how much you pay on on, on attention on Instagram, but he always kind of teases that he's got to come back. And I think last year he cut down to like 200, 220 pounds or hundred kilos for a powerlifting competition, so he can easily make that cut, cut. But he's always if he decides to do a contest, and whenever he does a contest, he generally goes all in. 
So he puts in more effort uh, than and more time and just um, than most competitors. But he'll go all in on one competition. So he would be a big threat, and he he's a great competitor um, as long as his knees hold up. And then and then I'll, I'll be interested in terms of um, Adam Dirks how he's going to fit into the mold if he decides to um, bec- become a regular 105 kilo competitor. He I think he was going to do a couple of the qualifiers, but ended up moving to Nashville and opening up a gym there. So I think that was a big, um, of course, professional step for him. So now that he actually has a little more established pl- uh, place, um, a little more um, time to train, I think he's going to put something together. So I'd be really be interested in terms of how that would look going forward. Yeah, and uh, I mean, Dirks, so for the for those who don't know, uh, Dirks and uh, Clayton are both heavyweight pros, right? They're both, and I mean, Clayton has done, he's not just a guy like, like De Marinas. He got his heavyweight pro card, but he never went on to uh, like be a, a huge threat in the heavyweights. And I don't know if he just didn't want to commit to getting that big, but Clayton was like a good heavyweight. Like he got, like you said, he went all in, he got big. He was in contention for the overall Axel world record. Uh, I think that's how he blew out his knee, right? It was like on a 470 something Axel clean. Um, And he was supposed to go to Clash last year and he got hurt. Um, If he came back, and I I don't know what kind of hit his static strength would take, but he was good enough to be really good when he was still competing as a middleweight. And AJ Dirks has like well over a 900 pound deadlift, uh, I believe. Uh, He was coaching Nathan Goltry, who uh, spent some time at my gym. Uh, He's another California guy. And uh, I just saw the amount of volume, the amount of work that he prescribes. Like, and I know that guy's a workhorse just seeing what he expects out of his athletes. That would be extremely interesting. I was really surprised how, um, I don't think anybody disregarded him, but I remember last year everybody was giving their predictions and I thought a lot of people were sleepy on on Mays. Nobody really brought him up. Nobody really mentioned him. I didn't really know that about his training, but watching him at Worlds the year I competed, I saw that he was like kind of step, step for step with like the best guys. And uh, it, it looks like he definitely has that base. I didn't know he was that young. But he also looks like he has room to put size on his frame. Like Mays looks like he could gain another fifteen or twenty pounds and still make the cut. So if I want to say he probably walks around like ten pounds, ten or twelve pounds over. Is that right? Over the week plus. Shit. So I have like twenty five percent body fat. I walk around like thirty pounds over. So he's got he's got a big margin. Um, yeah. So that speaks as to like how far the middleweights can go. And I kind of judge the middleweights. I don't know. When I think of worlds uh, with like the open, like the guys that have been around forever. I think of um, a lot of time to build a talent pool, a lot of time to find what the prototypical athlete looks like, a lot of time to recruit. You know, you had 40 plus years for the sports kind of marinate. And with these kind of newer divisions coming up, I look at someone like you starting to represent like what the top looks like. But I'm really excited for the middleweights because when I, I think when it starts to hit its stride, I think there's going to be a couple of Nick Cambys and that's when it's going to be like, okay, there's a barrier to entry. It's not like you're going to get somebody who's just strong, who can come in and, and take over or somebody who's just kind of fast. It's like, that's where like, uh, I think that, uh, I think where the sport's going to come into its own in that division. How did you see the, uh, women's division kind of manifest over the weekend? They had what, just the, the, uh, middleweight women. Is that right? Yeah. So the middleweight, uh, middleweight women. So it was their invitational. So they had, um, eight athletes and I knew that's the top three were probably going to be the ones that could, could have fight out. So the top three was like Nadia, Sam, and then Mel ended up winning, but that you kind of had an idea of that. They're all going to be fighting each other. I thought it was gonna be more of a battle between, um, Nadia and Mel, but Mel really kind of took over, especially Ooh, at the itchy. lift. Um, like, cause Nadia kind of like struggled through 10 reps on 450, and then Mel destroyed it just like eat this, like with reps to spare. She had like five done. reps left in her. Like, yeah, she did. The, the 11th rep and, was on, it wasn't slow, it wasn't strained. It was like, yeah. I, I was surprised she didn't put an exclamation point on it just to drive the point home. But, and, and we all saw Nadia like beat up on everybody at OSG. So it was, it was surprising to see, so, see someone come in and give her a run for her money. Yeah. I'm, I'm mad at Nadia. I know Nadia because uh, she trains at at, at Finnerty's gym in Fontana, which was like 15 minutes away from my gym. Nadia is insanely talented. For one, that girl should be making money as like uh, a B-movie actress. Like she should be doing like, 
I don't know, like Terminator knockoff movie. She has such a distinct look, and I think she has a very marketable look. And I think like the way Eddie Hall marketed himself, I think she absolutely could. Uh, she's extremely muscular, uh, attractive, uh, long like predator braids, but she looks tough. But she was picked like another world record too. She or yeah, picked up an American record this weekend. Is that dumbbell. right? When the so dumbbell? Sam, yeah, Sam ended up being on the on the world record, but she picked up an American record. Okay, and that's it. I don't even think she's that good at dumbbell, like technique wise. You know what I mean? Like she's an insanely strong presser. And she can show up and uh, just kind of muscle through an American record. Um, not, Nadia was like, she was like a choir girl, I think. I think she was like a, C she had no athletic background. She'd never really lifted weights. She met Finnerty. He got her, I don't know if it was through a boot camp or what, but he got her lifting. Within like a couple of years, she was like setting world records, just like out of nowhere. Um, very, very talented girl, but very strong. I don't think she likes to get into the weeds during training. So I think she gasses out. So statically, she might very well be the strongest person there by a mile. But watching uh, uh, Mel tear through the deadlift, it's like that's capacity. That's your motor. That's the stuff you have to suffer through if you want to edge people out by that margin. You can't leave that on the table. And I think it's similar with um, moving events, things that require speed. I think they really like going heavy. Um, but it's like, man, just a little training shift. And I think Nadia would be untouchable. But it was still cool to watch them battle it out. I mean, those are the best in the world at, at that division. Um, who? What ended up happening with the dumbbell world record? Who is the the girl that took that? Uh, Sam won. Um, okay. I, for, I can't pronounce her last name, like Bellevue, but uh, okay. from Quebec. Okay. Um, and was that just a middleweight record, or was that like overall dumbbell record? I think I want to say it was over. I want to say it's overall. Um, it was like 187 pounds. I. It, which is which is pretty heavy. That's pretty heavy. Um, I watched Kristen Rhodes put up a 170 a couple of years ago, uh, and with Leifa. yes, yeah, she was training for that. And uh, I made a training day with her and a couple of the guys uh, when I was prepping for uh, the Arnold. And it, it was funny because it was like J Joe Buckley, who's he's a pretty good middleweight, but then Andrew Mock was out there, and you saw as the weights were getting, you know, they come out with the lead. It was a rogue dumbbell. They're adding shot. And you could see as like I did my Arnold run through, and then as they were adding weight, you saw Mock's eyes get kind of big, like like I better kick this into high gear because Kristen was about to like usurp their dumbbell, but she was in contention for that record. So yeah, I'm, I'm that sounds right, a 180 something is being the overall record, and that's coming from a middleweight competitor. That's insane. That is a big, that's a big deal. That is a big performance. Um, how would you rate the events were a little bit different for the women? Um, I mean, how would you rate overall, like the, the competition, the back and forth were the top three pretty much running away with it. Was there, was there any drama? Was there uh no, you, you kind of have a feeling that like, it, obviously Isaac put the pressure on Mel, like Isaac won the, won the championship. So now Mel needs to, of course, match her significant other in, in terms of like winning the thing. So I think Mel, I think Mel was kind of like, Kind of went in there, kind of favor. I think she was she did well at the Arnold, so she came in with a lot of steam. Um, but you had uh, individuals like Jody Kennedy and also um, Aaron. Um, oh shoot, I blanking on uh, Wank. Uh, I don't want to say Wanklet. Uh, she's got to get mad at me. Aaron <laughs> Wanklet. I, I don't want to say Wanklet because that's not how you say it. Uh, Wanklet. Uh, sorry, Aaron, if you're listening to this, but uh, and James, <laughs> but but. Uh, Aaron's really good at um, long distance. So the Husa felt, I think she ended up winning and like, and then edging over Mel. Um, also some of the, the, the odd object, odd object medley, she did really well on too as well. So she really kind of picked it up there. So some of the other kind of competitors were able to be uh, pretty competitive on those things, but the top three were just the most consistent. That's uh, the, the bit I saw. Um, I mean, it, like I was talking about the middleweights, I mean, for as much as how they ticked up, you still get a feel that there's a little bit to go before it reaches this critical mass. We're watching the women's over the last couple of years and just the amount that it's grown. I mean, the sport went from not really having a women's division to about, what, 10, maybe 12 years ago, women's divisions were a little more regular. And then now it's like the numbers that are hitting. I mean, I can't get over watching Melissa hit that deadlift. That was... I mean, on any given day, I wouldn't feel good about going and pulling 450 for 11, you know, um, regardless of the height. So it, it's just showing like how much this is ticking up 
it's it's impressive. It's like the next couple of years are gonna get nasty, man. You know, it's you know, it's, but it's finally we're starting to get some like so of course like Mel and Nadia, this and of course as many many others, we're starting to get some like regulars that are always at that, those top contests, and you've seen their names the last few years. Uh, previously, like when I was like even getting onto like the amateur Arnold um, stage, you would have like the previous winner, and then they would get this edged out by a new girl. And that new girl will get edged out by the next year's new yeah. girl. And then that girl will get yeah. edged out by the next year's new girl. So it's, it's so it just kept, so you never really know who was going to be, um, of course, that top top lady. Because then a lot of them will either kind of burn out or not necessarily, not stay in the weight class or or do something else. Uh, but they weren't really staying in really kind of dominating that division. So we're finally getting that. But in the past, it was, it wasn't, um, we always kept seeing new new championships, and now we're starting to see some consistency. You know, that's a really good point. I remember that there used to be what they call the curse of the middleweights because the heavyweights had this avenue to go up and do all kinds of great things. And the middleweights, when they got their, their pro card, or I guess it was a curse of the pro card, so many guys would get their pro card, and they just would never do anything ever again because there wasn't, there wasn't an obvious evolution, I guess, as to what you could do. And that probably contributed to a lot of the turnover. The... Um, there needs to be a certain amount of staying power. You need to have enough good people at the same time, right? To get something that looks like a run. Uh, and this brings me to uh, another question that I want to pose because that's enough of the positivity. We've been a little too positive okay. right now. So let's get into some controversy, but yeah, that's, I like it. I want to see that face when, uh, when you go to, to deadlift next time, Nick, Nick, for those of you that don't know, Nick is such a nice guy. He's like, he's like unnecessarily kind and positive and welcoming and everybody that that's wants because, to because my grandmother is that what it is she instilled that's that in you yeah i think so though. that's and it's great it's a great quality but it's also when you compete against somebody you want reasons to like hate them because you want to think about that when you go up you're like screw this guy but nick's just so likable man you you can't you can't unlike it. um okay so a little bit of controversy i don't know how controversial this is gonna be but um going into the future of the sport and we're starting to see different factions break off People kind of have a vision for how they want it to go and what they're trying to infuse into it. One thing that stands out to me, and I want to get your take on this, it looks like um, it's kind of like trickle down. Like we're trying to get some of these other divisions, the women's divisions, their day in the sun. We're trying to get exposure, give more opportunities and so on. Do you feel like, or are you worried at all that there might be a point where there there isn't demand or at least the potential to create that many opportunities to the same degree for so many different divisions? Do you feel like at some point we're going to have to choose or do you think it's just a matter of the right people making the good marketing decisions? So you, f- you feel like we might get oversaturated with all the weight classes and, divi- and, and divisions? Um. That's something I'm, I'm personally worried about. Not worried in that, worried in the sense that, uh, Like, look at how powerlifting grew. Powerlifting got, I mean, I started lifting weights when powerlifting was still uh, a bunch of like fat, bald idiots in their garage, right? Nobody, it was a freak show. Nobody wanted to do it. And then raw lifting came back, got really popular and it grew, grew, grew. But then there was this bubbling off of feds, which kind of spread it thin. And then there was this hyper saturation of weight classes to the point where you get empty divisions and you get a lot of people that don't like the idea of consolidating records. So I just, when I look at things, I'm wondering what the threshold is, uh, that it's sustainable. You know, at what point can you have a clash for, for the heavyweights, for the women, for all the subclasses? I mean, I've heard masters get on and say, what about us? I think there's, what about the masters? What, so everybody forgets, question, everybody forgets about the masters. And then they're like, what about the lightweight masters? What about, the what about the weight class masters? You know, <laughs> what about the the women's you know one ninety eight masters of it? And very quickly, it be, it becomes reasonable in the beginning. Like, yeah, sure, they should have their their divisions, but when you're trying to get the spotlight, the funding, the attention, I mean, it's a scarce resource, attention, funding, and so on. So, um, yeah, I'm just curious where you stand on that, as far as or, or what you think the future holds for um, for these divisions. So I, I kind of like the a little more of, you know, hopefully going forward, there's just like the strong man, the competitive nature just in between the people, but that goes within the 
um, actual organizations. I hope they all stay kind of competitive in terms of putting the best product, not only for marketing, but also for the athletes. So if that kind of continues of um, different um, factions, of course, working uh, to put out the best product, then the sport's going to grow. Um, having the different weight classes, I think that, of course, there's a lot of qualifiers and regionals more than ever. Like, I think, when, of course, when I was five or six years ago, probably there was only one avenue. Now there's probably four for like middleweight per se. Like you could say like right now for middleweights, you could compete in Strongman Corporation, USS Nationals, OSG and Clash, and which is which is nuts. That's so many opportunities. But I think it's just going to bring in uh, more talent. And then we, we need to start kind of almost rivaling other other sports like either like Olympic lifting or powerlifting. We start taking some of those top athletes away because there's more opportunities uh, and, sh- and show it isn't more fun. And I think strongman is more fun for powerlifters. I'm sorry, most of the gym, my, my gym is a powerlifting gym, but just for strongman, there's so many different facets to push yourself and there's so many different challenges. Um, so for the most part, I think that it's going to, as long as things start staying competitive and the more opportunities there are, is going to bring on more people. And then I'll kind of trickle itself into the right places going forward. I don't disagree with you. I, for, I mean, for one, I stay with it as much as, as much as it raises my blood pressure and keeps me up at night and takes a toll on my body. I, I stay with the sport. I love the sport because it is, it's more entertaining. It's more fun to prep for. I think it, it, dare I say, I believe we're more useful. Uh, you know, it's like strength always has this, uh, connection or association to allowing you to do things other people can't do. And in a lot of strength sports, it's so niche and so focused, it stops being that. So I think there is a broader appeal. I definitely think there is a market. Uh, I am just very eager to see, you know, the prize packages. I mean, God, they're they're getting bigger. I mean, I remember, I mean, what was the, the first place at World's Strongest Man for, you know, 2000? And then you look at this pissing contest they got into with the Arnold and they were giving bigger prizes. And there's a point where, you know, well, can we do that for the 198s? Can we do that for the lightweight women? Can we do that for the masters? So I'm very interested to see where it goes, but I do have a lot of appreciation for the opportunities that exist as just from a selfish point of view. It's like, okay, well, I haven't been grinding for 15 years for nothing. Now I can get a nice vacation. And, you know, maybe if I play my cards, right, end up uh, broadcasted on the network. So that, I, that is kind of cool. Um, I wanted to segue the comp- uh, conversation a little bit into a training strategy. We talked about training just kind of superficially. Um, we were referencing your seemingly meteoric rise over the last year, even though you've been chipping away very steadily. Uh, when you structure your training, like just kind of foundationally throughout the year, um, how do you kind of organize it long term? What type of things do you focus on? And what do you feel like contributed to, uh, you know, 2019, 2020, where you did kind of have that breakaway moment? Hmm. Sure. So I think when I, because I, for the most part, we talk about programming. I've always done it for uh, myself. There's one year where I had Terry Rady coach me for about six, seven months. And he did my programming, but I was able to get a lot of um, missing pieces from Terry's programming and add it to my own train of thought. So I won that going forward. So, but I generally like three week blocks um, of different things and um, getting closer to the competition. I would like to um, get more event focus and then those accessory movements are, are very are very uh, focused on um, the actual event. So, for instance, we, we were talking about the squatting uh, per se. I would like to, of course, I like to do the big um, the event squat and then follow up with a leg press. Um, so I'm really, really destroying my legs, but uh, I'm almost like bulletproof. And so even if, I, if there's still, I can still have energy or still get more um, power exertion out during um, after the actual competition, I can kind of fish that on the leg press. So there's always kind of like a finisher. So even on deadlifting, I would have like 13 inch pulls after to really, again, pull so I can really pull from the bigger position. Um, but I would say that my go, even going into the prep and I ended up getting, getting hurt. Um, I think this time around I was too gun ho given the, the year I just had, I should have just figured out that, and I thought I was toning it back, but I didn't tone it back just enough. Um, I should have t- taken more time off and really kind of assess uh, what I needed going forward. I was almost too, I was almost kind of like striving, per, per, striving for per, perfection. So I kind of drove myself 
uh, mad. So what, what I ended up doing was I started doing two big blocks before I started a 12 week block. So I essentially did like an 18, 18 or more week um, training block going into class. And I ended up kind of uh, breaking down the last kind of five weeks or so. So if I could do it back, I would have started right at the 12 weeks and I started with ramp up, which was similar to what I did last year, um, just because I was forced to last year because I was coming off an injury. Um, so very starting out, I, was, I would have started like almost like 50, 60 percent in that first block and started kind of like ramping up. Um, and then I don't like, like for instance, that clashed was an interesting contest just because it had 10 events. So I was never, just because I had so many events and so many implements, I wasn't going to train, um, to competition weight. So my goal on the squat was to work up to something like 570 for a lot of reps. Um, I think originally we, we were going to have a 675 deadlift and I was going to, I wasn't going to go as high as, um, 650. Um, so I generally would like to kind of work more towards, um, bulletproofing and having some extra volume rather than actually hitting certain weights. Um, when we did ASM last year, um, I thought I was kind of also working on building up my deadlift when I was working towards the log, um, the log record. But I knew that if I could hit, let's just say like 700 for once, one set of like four or five, I would be in a good position to pull close to eight. And that was kind of my goal. I want to hit the volume. I didn't want to, I didn't really need to go um, to like 740 or 750 to feel the weight in my hands before that max pull. I know that I was able, I would have been able to get that prior if I put the work in, in terms of less weight. So um, I'm not a proponent of doing competition weight. Um depending on which, which type of implement, but, um, I really would like to kind of like, at least just standard, like linear periodization leading up. But I think the, what I've, again, during that run, um, I started doing more deload weeks. So three weeks on deload, three weeks on deload and, um, as much as I can, but some of the preps, um, are sometimes are not even I- ideal. So like, for instance, when I went to Russia, it was like a three week prep, um, in between the log record and ASM, it was like a two week prep. Um, but I already touched some of the events prior, but it was really like a two week intensive prep, um, OSG. Um, I think I overtrained for that, but I originally did two weeks on one week off, two weeks on one week off and then competed. Um, so of course a lot of things, I throw a lot of those things in, in your, in that, uh, in that answer, but, no, that's um, great. but pretty much, um, I always try to figure out what's, what's, what the competition has hand, because my goal is to win the contest, not necessarily hit certain weights, um, what I, what I lack in, and then, um, I'll always try to work the best events or, or work my worst events the most so I can become that well-rounded individual. So like, let's just say for even this clash, I toned down my pressing who like I used to press twice a day or twice a week. I turned out a one, once a week and that press day was like a, on my worst day, like after a big heavy lift, just because I didn't like, I don't really need to be better at pressing. I know I can beat everybody in my pressing. I, I didn't get the other events. So actually keg throwing was like going to be my big surprise this year. I probably threw like 12 different days leading up to um, this clash, but I really wanted to just like see if, if I could just, I wanted to win that keg throw. That was like my goal going into, um, into, into clash. And then they ended up having the keg throw. So I wasn't, wouldn't be able to show everybody that, but um, that's something, again, I was kind of training the weaknesses super important, but um, that's something I really wanted to show everybody. The bulletproofing comment uh, really resonates. It reminds me of like what Ed Cohen would talk about uh, as far as like creating a suit of armor. He talked about doing all the accessory to make this suit of armor that would make him resilient and it reinforces his uh, lifts. So it sounds like you take instead of doing what a lot of people I think do, which is hyper specialized, hyper focus, like, oh, it's a 700 deadlift for reps. So I'm going to start, the, I'm going to do that 12 weeks out. I just want to see what I can do. And then every workout is, is contest, contest, contest. Sounds like you're taking a very kind of outside in approach, like using a lot of other things to kind of prop up that, uh, that event, that performance. And, um, uh, which I like, I mean, uh, it took so many years to realize just in myself, all the weaknesses that develop when you just do contest prep and nothing else. And then you end up with these big glaring weaknesses that limit progress. Um, and the pressing one times a one time per week. That's so I used to get uh, Scott Brengel screaming in my ear uh, about uh, being a one trick pony because overhead is the first thing I was ever good at because I have tiny little arms and it doesn't have to go very far. Um, and I remember 
the hit to my ego when I had to drop pressing to a lower frequency to accommodate other work for things I was shitty at. It was like the hardest things. It was my favorite thing to do. It's what I was the best at. And I would say even over the last, I would say my best pressing was probably four or five years ago when I was like a much worse strongman, but I was a much better presser. I mean, I take the bar out, be floating up by my nose. You know, it's like I had all this tightness compression, but, uh, and that speaks to what you have to do. So that that's uh, interesting to hear that you intentionally put that on the back burner. It's like so you you adapt to what you need to become the best self to win that contest. So whatever you need to adapt, that's kind of what you got to do. Exactly. It's not it's not wishful thinking. It's not I like doing this, so let me just keep doing that. It's problem solving. It's I'm deficient here. That's where all the that's the basket I have to put all my eggs in. I'm curious about um, kind of as a general training principle because you mentioned kind of like a broad linear periodization approach which I'm all, I'm a big fan of. I, I do a very kind of broadly like intuitive, just start light ramp volume up and then get heavier and start take volume boy. Do you have any like kind of hard, fast rules or, or rules of thumb as far as like how hard do you work in any given set? Um, like how, how often you push it, if you push it at all, do you ever take sets to failure or do, um, kind of limit testing sets or do you really avoid that? So on the peak week, so on the last week of the block, so this if, if it's a three week block on the at last week, um, for instance, on like a deadlift or a squat or a press, um, I would do maybe like a kind of a two sets to get going. And that third set, I call it a competition set. So you're almost make, mimicking like getting ready, like you're doing it in the competition. Um, so that it could be like a, let's just say it could be the third set of six on strict pressing, but that set of six. Um, is going to be the fastest, is going to be the, the strongest, and you're going to be confident to hit it. And sometimes it might be, I might do two extra reps or something like that. But on that peak week, I will treat that one of those, one of those big sets. I'll, I'll make a big set to treat it as like a competition set. That makes sense. I'm a big fan of uh, doing like an AMRAP or something at the end of all your working sets. Um, I mean, you get the benefit of like getting deep into that threshold while also getting the volume, but it seems to mimic strongman pretty well. Like, pulling out the AMRAP when you're already a little fatigued. Like, like you're not, it's not your first say, you're not quite fresh. Um, and I feel like that does a lot to insulate you to the demands of the sport. Um, you, sir, are, uh, are on YouTube, yes? Yeah, so just, just I, I started that back up in September, um, October, and you used to be on YouTube probably back in like around college, 2010. Um, and I have, of course, some like funny videos. And then I was started doing some strongman competitions I where I used to edit, put a bunch of techno music and <laughs> try to be a little different uh, in terms of uh, everybody like heavy metal and rock. But I'm, I'm a big uh, electronic guy. So I used to put, put out the music. But now I want to put out more content. So I have my podcast. I started the training vlog and then I ended up getting the, the, the weeks that I wanted to do the training vlog this past uh um, training cycle, I kept getting hurt, so I didn't. I didn't really. Have, I couldn't really do the vlog because I was. I was trying. To, I didn't want to overdo it because I wanted to still focus on training. Because it. And then of course, when I see people really put on YouTube like yourself, it does take a lot of work in the editing, the publishing, um, and then even getting the good angles on training. Um, and and you provide some commentary as well. So that's of course I see all the layers. So I always appreciate all that work. Um, but yeah, but I've been ramping up on that. So hopefully to put on more content and do some hopefully like meetups and also collaboration with the other guys. Oh, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. And I try to really focus on 105 kilo. I don't want, I want to be, that's kind of like, I want to be that, that'd be my niche for YouTube going forward. Well, it's a perfect spot to start because it's, it's growing. It's going to keep growing. Right. So, um, uh, I mean, you're, you're going to be the face of the sport. I mean, you're the, you're, you're the most guy handsome face. What's that? Most handsome face. And the then, most, uh, oh, and then, clearly. And then, and then Liz Charlie said I had one of the best hairs. <laughs> and then, and then of course, like, he's like, Lord, and then she's like, Lawrence, like, doesn't his hair look great? I'm like, <laughs> he's like, he's like, you're showing me up, Nick. Come on. No, that's, we all, we all have our, uh, our receding hairlines that, uh, we, it's not enough that he wins. He has to do it looking better than us. I had to check. Hey, like, I had to check my wife a couple times. The girls were out with. They're like, he looks like Clark Kent. I have to like, like remember who you're here with. <laughs> um, and, then, and then Anthony, me and Anthony used, Anthony used to go back on like who had the best hair. And now he makes it really easy because I don't even know what's going on. No comment. No, I saw it. I saw it in the background. Uh, 
there's a few jokes I can make about that I'm not going to make. But he's got the handlebars. He's got the greasy, slicked back hair. Um, it, it screams porn producer, which I don't know if that's the face that Strongman needs. Um, so, uh, oh, man, commenting on the YouTube channel, like the layers are absolutely right. I go back and forth with this because there's some guys that can just put a camera in their living room and they do amazingly well. I think of like Derek for more plates, more dates. Like it's, it's a webcam and it's a screenshot of whatever he's commenting on and that's it. A lot of people, like if I do a really good video, it's, it's five or six hours of editing. And it's like for what return, you know, you might get 10,000 views or whatever. So that, it is a commitment, but your, uh, your commitment to doing a vlog, like that's hard. Like I kind of had to draw a line in the sand. Like I don't film contests. Um, I don't like to film when I'm out in the world, like interact with other people because it requires so much of your time and attention. It's a, it's great content. Like you training, you competing like that should have a spotlight on it, but man, it's hard. It takes up a lot of time. I need a, I need a Romark of, of sorts going forward. That's Martins. Martins left out with Romark. He did. And, 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 and they're, they're going great. They have like three businesses together and they've been pushing. So I, I caught up with Romark was there this week and uh, Martins has stayed because he's still focusing. He's focusing on world. He's probably beat up after the Arnold. So he probably needs every, every time, every inch to dedicate to that training. And that's, that's, that's super important for Martins. We can come back and when, when worlds, when three major shows in a row, that'll be, that would be kind of, that would be nuts, like almost history in the making. Yeah, no, that, that would be incredible. And yeah, to be able to do it while juggling all that other stuff, it's what a lot of people don't know, like strongmen have to have day jobs. Like there's almost nobody can sustain, uh, assist, can sustain themselves off of just like prize money or competing or sponsorships. It's like even the best in the world. Like I remember Mike Jenkins, like RIP, like he had to quit his job as a teacher to go to worlds. Like remember like Derek Poundson was a cop, like, now guys are there it's better because it's social media but that's a hustle like you got to be able to monetize it, it takes a lot of work uh, even and, and then quick snippet uh, even like zadrunas um he, he he for instance like competed eight times last year as a masters and then he's also like a like a it's like congressman or select <laughs> yeah he's but he's also like a congressman selectman in his um hometown or county in lithuania because he's like i think it was one of his documentaries uh, but he was like, there's only so much time of the day. You can always spend that time somewhere else. So he he's even involved in the community. So it's really great. You, you really can do it all um, if you're able to really plan and f uh, focus your time on. Yeah. On, to have a well balanced schedule. Right? Definitely some notes to take from that. Right. You don't have to live out of your car eating uh, canned tuna to fill your lifting dreams. You can if you want. But. I mean, yeah, if you want, you know, it's, it's, do you. Um, and uh, you got a couple of programs out, right? Uh I like the themes. You got uh, bless this press, and then what's the most recent one? The, the Kingdom of God. I'm uh, sorry, Kingdom of Log. <laughs> uh, just similar Kingdom of God, but um, yeah, it's all from the Book of Canby. So I'm, I'm I'm working on another more of a lower body one because the last two of them have been my press. So my next program is probably going to be more um, leg day and deadlift, lower squat and deadlift focus. Um, and a lot of it will be kind of like because I had such a shitty deadlift for all these years, it's kind of how I kind of program myself in that. So that's probably my next plan. But um, I kind of enjoy more of the programs rather than kind of the one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one coaching. I kind of like working with a broader audience, that's, but eventually I want to get in one-on-one, -on -one, but I think that's be at when I'm done competing because I don't know if I can do both. Yeah, it takes, uh, takes a lot of time and attention. And we, we didn't really touch on it, but if anybody should write a book on deadlifting, it should be you. I mean, you went from being kind of low mid pack on the pull. I mean, I think you were kind of in the mid sixes for a long time. And I mean, I think you're comfortably over an 800 pound pull at the moment. Uh, you, you really put it together while doing everything else, which is extremely difficult to do, especially after a decade of competing. So, uh, I think people will be looking forward to see what, what tips, tricks, and secrets that has in it. So go ahead and tell the people, <clears throat> where can they find your uh, YouTube, your podcast and those programs? Sure. So, um, so for social media, Instagram is Camby Dude. Uh, I'm also on TikTok as Camby Dude Camby. YouTube, I'm Camby Dude. So there's a, there's a little bit of a theme there. Um, Strength Lead is where my programs are. So I got the two programs there and the third one coming. Um, and then um, I would just keep, keep your eyes out for some more contests. I'm, I'm, I'm planning on at least doing America's Strongest Man and World's Strongest Man um, later on in the year. So that's I hope to get healthy and compete again. That's awesome, man. I forgot to I forgot to tell you. Uh, you ruined my dinner the other night. Me and my girl, me, me and my girl, or my girl, my girl. I'm gonna get 
I'm gonna get divorced after that. My wife. Right. <laughs> Be my. I do it. I do it too. Uh, oh yeah, D- didn't you? Did you get engaged? You got engaged yes, recently, my, right? Yeah, my fiance. But I, I sometimes will say, "Girl, fiance." Uh huh. Yeah, and then the elbow to the face comes in when they hear that. You got to, you got to, you got to look behind you. She is she behind the the oh, no, the she's background. Looking at, she's looking at me though. That's funny, man. Um, no, I'm out with my wife. We're at a, a sports bar, and they had like. T- uh, uh, TVs at every table. So we had our little TV and then the big screens, whatever. And there were no sports on. So they were just playing the chive. And then all of a sudden, Laura's like, is that Camby? And they had your log pressing on it. It was like they were, do- they were doing a, compila- a compilation on chive TV. They had like Steffi Cohen doing hurdles. And then they had you. And they were displayed a bunch of your lists. And I'm like, I'm like, man, I can't get away from it. It's, it's everywhere. His face is everywhere. But <laughs> is that the, was the Waco log? Um, it looked like a, tr- maybe I thought it was a training log. It looked like oh, a couple of your bigger YouTube videos, but, um, I was like, that's recognition, man. You're in sports bars all over the country. It's going worldwide. Not, not too shabby, but just, just another day. Just, when they were like, but Bob was like, Hey, he's like, cause like, of course we were watching the contest, um, on ESPN after the, after they compete a few hours and Bob was like, can't be on TV. I'm like, Oh, this is just another day, Bob. It's like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you're like yawn, like I'm on to you. That's just uh, just another day in the life of a always, of a champion. Like, oh, how does it feel to be famous? I'm like, I've always been famous. People, other people are re- are figuring it out now. You just caught up to the times. I was always ahead. That's hilarious. Yeah. Well, go ahead and check out uh, Sir Nicholas Camby on uh, Instagram. Check out his YouTube channel. Those uh, programs are on Strengthly and follow his podcast, and you can get more uh, log pressing, deadlifting, and strongman wisdom. Mr. Camby, thank you so much for joining me today. Absolutely. And of course, I look forward to our next uh, press battle in the, in the fu- future contests. You might be holding your breath for that one, but we'll see. We'll, we'll see. There we oh, go. My breath is- <laughs> <laughs> At least a so. All right. Uh, thank you for tuning in, everybody. Uh, until next time, this is Bromley. I'll see you.